Welcome everybody, my name is Jim Rooney. I really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, this is one of a set of conversations about my father, Dan Rooney, and his approach to his professional life. I recently wrote a book called A Different Way to Win, Dan Rooney's Story from the Super Bowl to the Rooney Rule. And instead of just having me sit around and talk about him, I invited a few friends. Today I have with me Craig Wolfley, Kendall Simmons, and Ramon Foster. Guys, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for having Appreciate me. Appreciate Glad to be here. Pleasure. So, you know, I'm going to start with a story about the offensive line. I want to talk a bit about teamwork and my father today. But it's so special to have linemen on because I think that the line really epitomized teamwork in a way that is, that is, you know, exactly what I hope when the Steelers are at their best, what we really represent. And growing up around... You know, my father being in the football business, I got to go to the locker room some and the training camp. Um, we weren't allowed to get any autographs, but you always look forward to seeing Terry Bradshaw or Franco Harris or Lynn Swan. So then I start working for the team in, you know, in, in training camp. And I realized the offensive linemen are the guys that have the most interesting conversations. <laughs> they have the most fun. And they're the ones that, that really represent team the most. So do you guys feel the same about that? Oh, no question. No question. I totally agree with you. Easily. The, 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 the best statement I think you can make about any team is when you realize that the stars or uh, the, the small skill guys are uh, just what they are. And the, the, the greatest intellect usually comes from the uh, offensive line. Every person that, that has learned that says that. You know what I always used to say? Fat is where it's at. It's what's up front that counts. Boys, that's what we used to, whether it was in the meeting room, solving the world's problems before they kicked off the meeting, or whether it was out on the field, having each other's back, working together. It was all about the offensive line. It's true. It's true. So I talk about, you know, my father obviously overall was the architect of all the Steelers teams since, you know, he sort of took over in the 60s. But he had a great management team. He had Chuck Knoll, who, you know, was, in my mind, certainly the greatest coach in NFL history. And then he hired two other pretty good coaches after that. Mm -hmm. He had Bill Nunn, who might have been the most important scout in NFL history. And then Joe Gordon, who some of you guys know. Ramon, I don't know if you know Joe as well. But Joe was the R guy who really helped build this massive Steeler brand. And when I think about the relationship my father had with them and how they worked together as a team, trust was the most important factor. Can you guys talk about the trust that was built among offensive linemen, how you saw it play out in the Steelers? Was it special and unique in a certain way within the Steelers? Um, go, go ahead, Kendall. Go ahead, Ramon. You got it. You got it. Go ahead. Okay. I, I'll just say this. Since mine is, is, is uh, so fresh, like the guys that I play with um, recently, the trust and the communication and the relationship is by far one of the closest I've ever had in, in sports, period. And it's probably because we all, in a sense, grew up together. But it, it, it really goes into where Coach Tomlin have to tell us at the end of the season, you guys have to break. You can't be around each other so much. The conversations that we have is so close to family to where we've gotten to the point now where we have to play devil's advocate just to have a conversation. You know, and, and that's because of the relationship. And um, it's not just in the field house, it's also out of out of it. We go to Marquise's house, so where Al and I would have dinners together with our wives and stuff. Just simply, th those things don't happen unless you, unless you have that relationship and that trust and understanding more than anything that, that, that grows not only, you know, off the field, but on the field too. It'd be sometimes we don't have to say certain things and we just look at each other. I'm sure, uh, the guys can can say the same thing. It, it, it goes further with the that group than any other uh, position because there is no recognition really, except for maybe one or two guys. And after that, it's, it's all is one. Um, I came with an older group. And as a young guy and a rookie having a chance to start a lot of games and you come in with an older group, you talk about gaining trust in a, in a group you have to really gain those older guys' trust and show them that you can play at the same level and mm -hmm. communicate in everything. I never saw so much talking and communicating throughout the game the way this that group I came in with, Alan Fanica, Jeff Hardings, um, Wayne Gandy, 
um, Marvell Smith, those guys were so instrumental in my development as a player. And the, we hung out, just like Ramon was talking about, we having dinners with each other's wives, our kids growing up together and still having relationships with each other outside of this. I can go two, three months without even talking to Alan or Jeff or anything. And it's just like we walk out the locker room as soon as I speak to him or see him. That's the relationship that I have loved so much. And that's why Pittsburgh means so much to me because I don't have those type of relationships outside of that. Mm -hmm. um, other than my boys that I grew up with at home. And I would probably say the, with the guys that I played with on the offensive line might even be closer than that mm -hmm. just because of what all we went through. You know, Kendall, you just nailed the word love. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn to love the man to your left and the man to your right. You know, the beautiful thing about a locker room, the beautiful thing about a huddle, doesn't matter what color, shape, size, what have you. It's the men together, and nobody bonds better than that offensive line because you are so codependent on the guy to the left doing his job, the guy to his right doing the job. You know, you just – you got to do it together. And the beauty of it is is that bonding agent of love. Think about it when I broke in. I broke into an offensive line that had essentially been together for four Super Bowls. You know, I mean, it, you know – they wanted to accept you and they did accept me, but you know, it's a proving thing. It's one gaining their trust. You're the young buck. You've got to stay with it and everything else. And that's the beauty of, of being able to overcome and being a part of something bigger than yourself. And the offensive line was always bigger than any one guy. And, and to, to add to what Kendall was saying about that first start, I was a young guy. So I think it might've been about week 12 when I got my first start and it was against Baltimore in Baltimore and I never forget, like you said, it was a bunch of older guys. They were just off the Super Bowl. Uh, and I, here I was about to start for Chris Kimiatu, uh, Juices, who we called him. And uh, Willie Colon said to me, and it stuck to me the longest, and it honestly from through, throughout my career is that trust factor. Yeah. The only thing he really said to me was, when you feel like you've blocked long enough, block again. And then <laughs> block some more because you don't want to lose the trust of Ben or anybody else on that old line. And as a young guy, it can be intimidating, but if you're right-minded with, with the way um, training camp goes and the way your, your peers support you, 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 you look forward to that, though. But I'll never forget that. And I was like, well, how long is long enough? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I for sure wasn't going to let them down, though, because that trust will – Man, it, it can make or break your career, and and yeah, I'm yeah. I'm around some guys that really took that on the right way. So let let's talk a little bit. You know, I talk about my father. He hired Coach Noel. He hired Coach Cowery. He hired Coach Tomlin. But then they hired their assistants. And you know, we talk about management teams. Is there anything that your coaches, you, the assistant coaches that work directly with you folks, that help particularly building that offensive line, that cohesion that you guys need? I can say, and, and I hope I can use this language. <laughs> I, had, I had Russ Green. To me, he was one of the greatest mm -hmm. offensive linemen playing with the Hogs and a coach because he understood what the game was like. He told me a couple of things that I always it stuck with me for my whole career, and I tell young guys when I have a chance. The play is never run or blocked the way it's thrown up on the board. It never comes out that way, ever. And you all block differently, but you got to learn how to work together. And this is what he told me. He said, I don't care if you line up and block him backwards as long as you get the job done. I don't care what you do. You can butt block him like you boxing, boxing, boxing out for a rebound. Get the job done. You all block differently, but you got to work together. Don't try to do something you, you cannot do. And... We all learned that. There was so many things that Alec could do that I couldn't do, but I was good at. And Jeff was the same way, but we trusted each other. And Russ just had a way of putting things and talking to us. And he didn't talk to us all in a box. He knew everybody's personality. And that's what I loved about him because he could get the best out of all of us. I mean, he would always tell me I, I was like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> you got to learn how to slow down. Russ was, to me, one of the biggest coaches to help me for my whole playing career. Wow. Um, just to piggyback off that, 
Uh, that's the same way I feel with Coach Munchak. But before Coach Munchak was Coach Kugler. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and with him, Coach Kugler, my first few years, it was we got to fight. We got to find a way to make it happen. We, we have to make it happen. This has to get done because everybody's dependent on us. And however you get it done, make it happen. There was a whole lot of structure in that. But if you was to ask me what was his, his methods of getting it done, it was that. Get the job done however you can. When we got under Coach Munch, it sounded a whole lot like how Coach uh, Russ was. It was, you don't do what Marquise does. Marquise doesn't do what you do. Uh, Marcus, at the time, you can't do what, what the left tackle is doing. So I'm going to find a way to hone in all that you do. And Coach Munch was it, by far, I think, one of the best hires in the organization. However, Coach Tomlin and, 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 and the front office were able to get that done. I'm glad they did because I know for sure – for a guy like myself, it helped extend my career more than it probably, you know, people probably wanted it to in a sense. Having a coach in an organization like Pittsburgh coach you in a way that fits you and only you with the group in mind, I'm getting chills just talking about it because looking back on it, it's one of the coolest things because you can overcoach your kid. You can coach them too hard and not coach them enough. Finding a coach that's able to be able, that's able to do that, that well is, is huge. I'll never forget coach Munch and, and how he coached us throughout those years, man. Seriously. You know, the funny no, thing we're about glad you're with us. Go ahead. Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> oh, the, the common thread that runs through this are when you have coaches who they are bottom line, get the job done. I mean, in my 12 yeah. years, I was so blessed to start off with Raleigh Dodge, who was a really, he was a hard guy. I mean, you talked to Johnny Mitchell and, you know, Raleigh coached us very hard. <laughs> he, was, mm-hmm. uh, he was not a kinder, gentler, friendlier type guy, but he prepared you for what lay ahead back at that time in the 80s in the NFL. But I had also experienced some other coaches where, you know, you might get into film review and, you're talking to a player and uh, might say, you know, look at your stance, your angle your, of the, your ankle is bent about 90 degrees. You got a third and one, you got Reggie White sitting on you on a three technique on your nose. Wow. And it's like you're sitting there going, he's got bigger issues going on right now than the, ang- the bend of his ankle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So true. You need a guy who knows, been there, done that, and can – understand what you're going through, you know? And I think one of the beautiful things about it is the Steelers hired men like that. Your dad, Jim, he, he trusted people. Chuck Noll trusted people. And you coach them and you do it right and mm-hmm. you get the job done. Yep. No, exactly. You know, it's it's about trust. You bring people in you trust and then they bring in people they trust. And yes. that's, mm-hmm. that's what works. So, so let me move to the, I think it's a perfect segue to the next piece, this idea of consensus. So, Commissioner Tagliabue tells a great story, told a great story to me and that I told in the book about coming to consensus and that, you know, my father was was the lead negotiator in all these big negotiations. And they would have, you know, Commissioner Tagliabue was not the commissioner, he was the lawyer at the time. And they would have a 400 page document that they tried to get through. And my dad would say, no, 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 we're just trying to get these three things done today. And he always tried to get agreement. He always believed that if you could get agreement on one or two or three points, you could move forward in the conversation. So we always focused on that. How I see the line doing that is you, you guys each talked about, you know, this individual coaching and how important that was. But you also, when you guys were great, and there were so many times there was, you know, great blocking schemes, great runs, you know, obviously the great passing, but you were able to bring this together and build consensus among yourselves. Can you talk a little bit about how that consensus came about with, with the different levels of talent, the different personalities, uh, that each of you had on the lines that you played on? Um, I think for, for us, it, it became about being selfless and understanding of, of growth of certain players. You know, we, we went through um, we went through a transition phase, honestly, of moving from, I guess, some of the older guys, let's say, to Alejandro growing up. And us being, I, I don't want to say patient, but you, you got to get some inclusion with, with him. You know, it, breaking into that fold of having four guys already set, and here's this new guy, and you making sure that the new guy knows what he has going on and, 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 and realizing there's going to be mistakes made or, hey, you might have to cover for him here or there. The selflessness of playing that position is one of the biggest 
things that you have to have. I guess that's why the conversations are a whole lot deeper when you're around a group of guys like that and and realizing that, hey, this is what Dave does. So I'm going to ask him to do what Ramon does, you know, and, and, and not being – it's a position to where there's not many stats. And because there's not many stats, everybody has their role to play. And being okay with your role is one of the biggest things that you can have in the offensive line. Um, you can have a perennial Pro Bowl left tackle get every pro bowl and all pro that you can have and the right tackle is just as good and him not having an issue with you know his, his lack of recognition is one of the the most pivotal parts of having, having success as an o-line yeah fantastic kendall um i think like like ramon was saying how I, I was on the offensive line that we had three or four pro bowls and um in a way, it's a it's a lot of pressure to fit into that group, and some sometimes not feel like you are getting enough recognition. It's easy to fall into that, but those guys were so selfless in the way they approached the game and the issues of trying to help a young guy adapt to the NFL. I talk about Allen and Marvell are like my brothers. And they knew there were issues that I had, especially dealing with my diabetes and everything else. Um, they were always there to try to help me improve and say, okay, here's what you need to do better. It might not work for you, but you can at least try. It. Mm-hmm. And as a young guy, you always want to try to follow them because you see what they're doing to be successful. Whether you're as athletic at all, but if you can at least – Follow the mode and do what you can the best you can and them help you, your offensive line is going to be successful. I didn't have anybody in our group where they were point where I can't stay here because I'm not getting the same recognition. I want to go just like Ramon said, everybody knew their role. That left side, when Allen and Marvell were over on that left side, you get a lot of pulling and you get a lot of plays going to their side. Kendall, you know I've had diabetes now I think 45 years, so I always had such respect for you when you got that challenge i believe it was rookie your rookie year um and and you know i don't lift weights every day uh you know to to make sure my job that i'm the best at my job work out as hard as you do and all of the challenges you've taken on personally while being such a great team member with that is something you know that i do have a specific understanding of of what you've done so just just really grateful for that hey wolf let me switch this just a second and you know i i know you've done Tremendously good things building consensus, but we got to tell the one great story of not coming to consensus mm. that Webby had to tell with you, Webby, and Steve Corson against Bob Golick up in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> you know, miscommunication is bound to happen, isn't it, fellas? I mean, it does yeah. happen, right? Yeah. Well, um, we were in Cleveland, and of course, uh, Steve Corson and I were playing guards, the great, late, great Mike Webster. Uh, was at center. And Bobby Golick was uh, a good nemesis. This guy was, uh, you know, he was a tough guy, played low and all that sort of stuff. And he was just one of those guys that was always able to, you know, excel at that position, again, you know, and Mike and his battles were terrific. So anyhow, uh, we're in the huddle and somehow we got screwed up on whether it was a toss 32 or, 30, or three trap. Well, you know that when it comes down to it and the count's going, there's no time to be able to talk back and forth because – you got to zero in on anticipate anticipate that snap. So uh, Mike Webster just blurted out when, when I questioned him a little bit right before the snap, blurted out, Reed. Now, Reed Block, of course, is a double team. One of us is supposed to pull, two of us are double teaming on the nose tackle to the backside, uh, a linebacker, right? Well, uh, things got screwed up, so we came off the ball together, and um, all three of us triple teamed poor Bobby Golick. <laughs> Uh, back in the day, the way they coached, Mike Webster would post a guy. So he'd come under and up and get hold of the chest plate, lift the guy up. You'd come down and you'd bang his hip. Well, what really actually happened was all uh, me and Steve came down. Instead of banging him, we underhooked his leg. We literally lifted him up like he was in a mosh pit. Wow. <laughs> We carried him back like 10 yards wow. and slammed him on his back. And poor Bobby had his eyeballs rolled up in his head. 
Oh. And there's Steve, there's me, and there's Webby on top of poor Bobby. Nobody came off to get the linebacker on the backside. It was a one-yard game. <laughs> Nobody came off. And Webby gets up, and he looks at me, and he looks at Steve, and he says, um, Bobby, I'm sorry. We What we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> and he is screwed up. And Bobby, Bobby's laying there, and his eyes are, like, you know, spinning. He points at, at me and Steve goes, you guys got to get it together because this is going to be a day for me if you don't. Wow. <laughs> that, that was <laughs> miscommunication, man. That is that, awesome. <laughs> that, when Webby would tell that story, it was always one of my favorite stories. And I think I've heard Golick tell it a few times, too. Great story. The one well, part let's, that let's... was so beautiful when we carried him backwards, he bypassed the two inside linebackers. He's yelling, save yourself, save yourself. <laughs> Golick was crazy. He was just a nut job, man. Wow. That was good. Um, so let – Let's finish with a subject that, again, I've seen each of you take on personally in your lives and then as the group, as, as a team, and that's this idea of responsibility. I think, you know, the thing that my father really did, whether it was in Ireland, whether it was with the Rooney Rule, whether it was his commit to the team, it was this sense that he, he had a responsibility. It wasn't just about winning. It wasn't about making money. You know, he understood you needed to do all these things, but there was a sense of responsibility in everything he did. And I've seen each of you, you know, take that on in, in, in different ways in your life. So uh, can you guys talk a little bit about responsibility, what it was like for you and, and what it was like in the Steelers organization? Um, and I, I, this could get long-winded, but I'm going to make it quick. Um, <laughs> I spoke on my diabetes earlier and having a sense of responsibility to give back to the community that was laid that foundation was laid by your dad to me um and you dealing with it yourself having to deal with diabetes in your family and dealing with players before um player before me what it was what mr rooney told me and i remember him telling me this laying on the training room table he would always come in and check on me and he didn't have to do that but he did he always came in and asked me how i was doing and I'm being young and being hard-headed, you're trying to hurry up and get back out on the field. He said, listen, all I'm worried about is the well-being of you. You, I want you to get through this, listen to what they tell you to do, where you can live a long and healthy life. Do that first, and the grass will be out there. That will be there. With him telling me that, what y'all don't realize how much that meant to me, that meant more to me than anything else that I'd had going on through my whole career in Pittsburgh and football in general because he showed that he had a heart, that he was a human being. He cared about me more than just being an employee and as a football player. I want you to live and be healthy first. Do that first, and then you can play football after that. And he would always check on me. He would even ask my wife how I'm doing and she's doing. That showed what type of person he was. That made me want to do whatever I had to do when I got on the field and I knew I had somebody in the organization who had my back. And when I left, I wanted to do have that same sense of responsibility to the community, the diabetes community in general. If you, I can help you in any possible way, I'm here to support you no matter what's going on. If I can't find out and I can't do it, I can find somebody else to help you. And that's what your dad did for me and the organization did. So that was my whole sense of responsibility. Thanks, Kendall. Yeah, um, for for me, it goes down that same road in the sense that mine is just the impression um, that he left on me from the first time I ever met him. And here I am, you you guys know my story, young undrafted rookie free agent out of Tennessee. It's two things that happened within those first two weeks. One was um, Troy, knowing who I was. He, we're walking down and he's ha carrying out a box and it had like lost DVDs. And I looked in a box and he looked at me and it's like, you're Ramon. I was like, here's Troy, like on the, on the, on the, uh, the off a year of almost being like, I think defensive player of the year. And everybody knows who Troy is. And here I am, this lowly, uh, undrafted guy to Tennessee at the time was like, wow, he knows who I am. And another one was the same thing, walking out of the hallway from the trainer room and your dad. <laughs> looks over at me. This is still rookie year, early rookie year. It's like springtime. He's Ramon, right? And I'm thinking to myself, here's this guy as the head of this organization who's seen tons of players come in, thousands of players come in. 
and you take the time to know my name. That says a lot about the guys they choose to bring in, like Troy. It says a lot about him as a man. Him, it, besides being the businessman of, of, of one of the best organizations in the world, knowing who this young rookie offensive lineman in of all positions, the way you guys know, um, who <laughs> that don't get a lot of accolades and, 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 and notoriety, knew who I was. And I, it, it led me to be that type of guy in that locker room. You know, the, the team, Pittsburgh Steelers, it, it's usually following the same guidelines that your dad laid down. And the stories that, that people in the city tell is, is something that if we can all leave a legacy behind like that, the world will be a better place. And, 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 and just, I think if I was to label him, it would be he was for people, mm-hmm. not just a certain race or color. It was for people. And if anybody has anything bad to say, it, they really had to have pissed him off or something. Because mm-hmm. I just, that was my relationship with him. And he would talk to you, look to you with a stern face and just, it was exactly the way you're supposed to run a business and organization when you have thousands of people under you, but you're amongst the people. That was really cool for me. You know, you guys have beautifully laid out what I think, again, a, another common thread that uh, Mr. Rooney had. And what I, I treasured so much was I think his responsibility began with humility. And I've never seen from the chief down to your dad, Jimmy, to Art now and the whole family, um, the, the humility that was demonstrated is something that's always touched my life. i give you two quick stories. When uh, we, you guys played at MetLife Stadium, you know, the very first time when the Giants' new stadium came. And I'll never forget, I was uh, up in the press box and I was uh, hanging out and your dad came in. All right, now your dad was, I guess he calls it loafing with the guys, you know, up at the press box guys before the game, you know. So I'm standing there with Bob Labriola. So we're standing there, and um, your dad is talking to some of the press box guys, and this security guard is obvious. The first game, everybody's new, and there's a young security guy there who's feeling the pressure of doing his job, and he notices that your dad doesn't have any credentials on or anything like that. So he went over, and he, he says, excuse me, sir, do you have – any credentials? He said, oh, no, I, I, I don't have any. And um, so the guy said, well, I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave. And um, so your dad just looked at him for a moment and said, oh, okay, okay, young man. I, 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 you know, And it was all about your dad was recognizing this is a young guy, doesn't know what's going on. He's not going to get into this big deal. He walks on out. The guy comes over then and stands next to Bob Labriol and me. And the guy turns to the labs and he goes, uh, Gee, he seemed like a nice guy. He says, do you know who that guy was? And Lab said, yeah, that was um, the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers who happens to be a Hall of Fame, a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame and the sitting <laughs> U.S. ambassador to Ireland. Uh, you just threw him out. Have a nice day. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but it was such a beautiful moment to see humility expressed in action. That's cool. And yeah. I would summarize this on that uh, very sorrowful day when – we all came together and uh, we were at the chapel in uh, Oakland and um, at your dad's funeral. And I remember sitting there and looking around, there's the present players, there's players from the past, like, you know, Mel Blunt and Joe Green and all these guys, you look across and there's former president Barack Obama. You see owners, you know, uh, from the NFL, Bob Kraft and all that there. And we're all sitting there in this very somber moment. And then, just to my left down the aisle, a couple of guys from the north side came in with frayed jeans and hoodies on. And I thought, you know, your dad would have been so happy if he was there. <laughs> He'd have said, sit down, boys. You know, I'm happy. Thank you for coming and, and, and saying goodbye. And I just thought that those moments really spoke so heavily to me of what it meant um, to be a humble servant leader like your dad was. Well, guys, I want to say thank you. Your lives affected my father, the way the linemen played together. You know, that's what he believed in was coming together. So it's it's just really special for me to get a chance to, to talk to all three of you, to hear your stories. Um, I, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, so have a wonderful day. But um, just really touched by this this time together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you appreciate so much. It.